In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let us make human beings in our image. Let us make them to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. And over the past few months, I've been wondering if one of the ways we image God is through our very physical bodies. And let me unpack that a bit. As Christians or people of faith, we believe that right now Jesus has a body. He took on a body at conception, cells divided, yolk sac fed the baby, heart chamber developed, limbs and lungs all formed. He lived in a body and walked on this earth, breathed air into his lungs, saw images on his, ret on his retinas at the back of his eyes. He fought off infections with his immune system and he bent his knees. And Jesus died in a body, his kidneys shut down, his heart failed, his brain function ceased, and he took a final breath. And we believe that Jesus resurrected in a body in a glorified yet recognizable, same and yet different bodily form, Jesus took human physiology through death and into life. And now we believe that Jesus ascended with that body and with a human body is now seated at the right hand of God. Right now, Jesus has a body. The human body matters so much to God that he took one on and then he kept it. Jesus took a human body into the very Godhead itself, Father, Son, Incarnate, and Holy Spirit. And for all we know, right now, in some glorified and perfected form, Jesus still has a cardiovascular system a muscular skeletal system, an endocrine and exocrine system, digestive system, immune system, nervous system, renal system, and respiratory system, and eyes and ears and hands and feet and a face. A body that is like, in some glorified way, our bodies. Like your body made up of all those intricate, interdependent systems that are in themselves made up of sub-intricate, intricate, interdependent systems, and then on and on and on. A brain running the show, directing and controlling all your body systems that is itself made up of a universe full of interdependent neurons with a seemingly infinite number of possible neural connections. And kidneys now serving your body by maintaining homeostasis, equilibrium, balance. Each kidney having close to a million three centimeter long filters called nephrons all working together in this amazing collective way to keep you physiologically balanced. And the muscles now holding up your head. All of them together working as a team, the agonist, the prime mover, setting the direction that you're turning, and the antagonist working against the prime mover, and the fixators stabilizing everything, and the synergists aiding the movement of the agonist. And your heart pulsing with interdependent wonder right now, pumping blood this ocean of life-sustaining energies to all of your organs, each with their own calling and sphere, all together enabling you to be here. And all of those body systems working in concert, in sync, so that you can go for a walk or hug a loved one or write down a great idea or listen to and hear these words. This is the kind of body God made. And this is the kind of body that Jesus now has. So I think I do believe that our physical bodies in some way image God. They image a God who has a body right now in Christ. And they image a God whose very nature is an interdependent community that we reflect with our bodies 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Knowing what we know about God through the Bible and through the history of the church, his revelation, the human body is the kind of body a God who's that kind of God would create. Think about the interdependent nature of the Holy Trinity. The Father is connected to the Son and the Spirit, and the Son to the Spirit and the Father, and the Spirit to both Father and Son. The Trinity, as one writer says, is a circle of shared life, joy, wisdom, power, and grace. Each member a distinct and separate person with a unique nature and role, and yet the three are one co-inhering being. They relate to one another in a mutually submissive, cooperative, symbiotic, and synergistic way. The Father loves the Son, the Son glorifies the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Jesus does everything in accordance with the will of the Father. Their lives are in total sync. He perfectly images, embodies, and exemplifies the nature of the Father. Everything that Jesus does fits with who the Father is. And the Spirit only speaks what it hears from Jesus and the Father. All that the Spirit is and does comes from them and points back to them. And the Father is the wellspring of all things. He creates, sustains, sends, directs, and gives life to everything. The Son is the wisdom that makes it all work. The Spirit empowers it all. The Son and the Spirit glorify the Father. Everything they do comes from and points back to Him. This beautiful, flowing, interdependent community of love. And our physiologies, your body design and makeup and upkeep came from that kind of God. No surprise. So the question then becomes for me, what can my body and the nature of a human body teach us uniquely or in a new way about who you are, God? If this flesh and blood body is a word you spoke, what are you whispering, God? about who you are. And if my body is made in your image and a human body is now part of who you are in Christ, what does it mean to know you? I know you with my thoughts. I know you with my rationality. I know you in my creativity. I know you in all of those. What does it mean to know you physically, really know you through my body? Think about this next quote, what God is saying through the very nature of your cells. Dr. Lewis Thomas writes, We are shared, rented, occupied, at the interior of our cells, driving them, providing the oxidative energy that sends us out for the improvement of every shining day, are the mitochondria, and in a very strict sense, they are not ours. They turn out to be little separate creatures, the colonial posterity of migrant prokaryocytes, probably primitive bacteria that swam into ancestral precursors of the eukaryotic cells and stayed there. Ever since, they've maintained themselves and their ways, replicating in their own fashion, privately, with their own DNA and RNA, quite different from ours. They are as much symbionts as the rhizobial bacteria in the roots of beans. Without them, we could not move a muscle, drum a finger, think a thought. Mitochondria are stable and responsible lodgers, and I choose to trust them. But what of the other little animals similarly established in my cells, sorting and balancing me, clustering me together, my centrioles, basal bodies, and probably a good many other more obscure tiny beings that work in my, inside my cells, each with its own special genome, are as foreign and as essential as aphids in anthills. My cells are no longer the pure line entities I was raised with. They are ecosystems more complex than Jamaica Bay. And I like to think that they work in my interest, these mitochondria, that each breath they draw for me. But perhaps it is they who walk through the local park in the early morning, sensing my senses, listening to my music, thinking my thoughts. His whole book is like that. (laughs) Brilliance. 
And I read a quote like that from Dr. Lewis Thomas, and I'm reminded of how interdependence works and how interdependence in particular in relation to this foreign mitochondria residing in our cells for so long, how interdependence celebrates and enfolds and draws into itself difference. In fact, the brilliance of what interdependence results in is its ability to make more out of those differences. Interdependence thrives on difference. Our cells are more because of these mitochondria and other little foreigners and others who are floating around inside each one. And God's people in the Bible, we're told, were more when they took a foreigner in or an alien at their gate or made room for the other. And we are more as individual human beings when we put our stereotypes and judgments of other people aside and we draw them into community with us and make room for the other. And for all we know, God is more when he takes a human body through Christ into himself and then through Christ's human body, all of our human bodies, and then through all of our human bodies in a very seemingly direct line way, all of creation, all of the cosmos into himself. Let me explain that. When Christ took on human nature, the DNA that made him the son of Mary may have linked him to a more ancient heritage stretching far beyond Adam to the shallows of unimaginably ancient seas. And so in the incarnation, it would not have been just human nature that was joined to the divine, but in a less direct but no less real sense, all those myriad organisms that had unknowingly over the eons shaped the way for the coming of the human. And taking that idea further, if what all the physicists know and the astrophysicists know that we really are made up of stardust, starting at the Big Bang, and all of those elements developing to the point where they could come together in this way, we are made up of stardust, then through the resurrection of the body, every physical thing that fills the universe is made, through, through, made new through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God is a God who takes foreign things into himself. God is hospitable in that way into the community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he has room and has made an invitation to all of us into seemingly everything that fills the universe. That's God's way of relating, of being. And that little cellular parable is preaching inside of you in every single one of your cells right now. Can you feel him speaking? Those bursts of energy from those mitochondria, foreigners, his Holy Spirit energizing every cell so that you could have life, an empowered life, a life that can do something, a called life, a strong life. If all of our 600 muscles were to pull together in one direction, we could lift 25 tons. Our ears can discriminate among more than 300,000 different tones, while our eyes can distinguish about 8 million color differences. One cubic inch of bone can withstand a two-ton force. Each day, our bones manufacture one billion blood cells. Red blood cells feed the muscle cells of the heart, which in turn propels the red blood cells around the body. This beautiful circle of red blood cell love. Lewis Thomas again. We are paying too little attention and respect to the built-in durability and sheer power of the human organism. Its surest tendency is towards stability and balance. 
It is a distortion with something profoundly disloyal about it to picture the human being as a teetering, fallible contraption, always needing watching and patching, always on the verge of flapping to pieces. This is the doctrine that people hear most often and most eloquently on all of our information media. We ought to be developing a much better system for general education about human health with more curricular time for acknowledgement and even some celebration of the absolute marvel of good health that is the real lot of most of us most of the time. And he doesn't say that to somehow shine a negative light on sickness and brokenness and illness, but in the bigger scope of things, I think he's right. God is keeping us in ways more and many miraculous ways than any of us can imagine. And he's drawn you into his life through Christ. And he's put his Holy Spirit, he's entered into your body and being by way of his Holy Spirit. And he's woven you into his interdependent being. Right now, that's where we are, collectively and individually, into a place of unimaginable strength where we to really think about it that's where you are you're not alone on your own some little cell you're woven into that we're the church is woven into that strength and goodness and love and that is a marvel we're celebrating we should be dancing unshakable eternal power Jesus, I've given them the glory that you gave me, Father, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, the world, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am, with him where he is and to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you have loved me before the creation of the world. And he made your body as interdependently amazing as it is so that you would have the freedom to step into that prayer answered, your calling, kingdom, come and coming here on earth. To have the strength and the wisdom and the energy to be a part of what God is doing in you, in our city, in our world. The power and humility to to depend on other people because you're more when you do that. I'm more when we do that. The wisdom to serve others and be served by them in an intertwining, life-weaving, power-imbuing, peace-bringing, life-giving way. This is how God made you in your body to be, all those different systems hanging together in a perfectly woven miracle, physiological miracle. This is how God made your life to be. And God's already put it all there in your body, in his church. The church is like a body with all kinds of different parts, and it's how God makes churches. And we're free when we really believe it and know it with eyes of faith to just live into it because it's, in a way, already there. We're already there. We do not have to learn anything. Our smooth muscle cells are born with complete instructions in need of no help from us, and they work away on their own schedules, modulating the lumen of blood vessels, moving things through intestines, opening and closing tubules according to the requirements of the entire system. Secretory cells elaborate their products in privacy. The heart contracts and relaxes. Hormones are sent off to react silently with cell membranes, switching adenal cyclase, prostaglandin, and other signals on and off. 
Cells communicate with each other by simply touching. Organelles send messages to other organelles. All this is going on continually in your body without ever a personal word from us, from you. The arrangement is that of an ecosystem with the operation of each part being governed by the state and function of all the other parts. When things are going well, as they generally are, it is an, an infallible mechanism. And then Lewis Thomas goes on in the book to imagine. Imagine if you had to run all that <laughs> yourself. He, he likened it to all of a sudden be, being given the controls of a jet plane. <laughs> Here, go. By providentially taking care of an infinite number of small and yet so miraculous things in your life, in your body, God frees you up to work and love and enjoy and play and ponder the meaning of life. And even as the interdependent power of our bodies enables us to get on with higher order things in our daily lives, so too does our interdependent place within God's body, within his kingdom coming, now in part, one day fully, enable us to get on with the highest order of things, knowing God more. In Christ, it is, it's done. It, now, not yet, now. It's done. The, the basics of creation and salvation and resurrection are already done. And now you can get on with it, living this kingdom life. Last little parabolic truth we'll draw out of the nature of independence, and this is going to come up again and again through our series of different body parts. Interdependence is ultimately about relationship, which Pastor Rich named in our research study science class group together. He said, theologically, I think the best word that gets at the nature of interdependence is relationship. Relationship is the logic of creation. What drives God to create is a desire to share his love and expand his relationship to include creation and humanity as the image-bearing apple of his eye. Rich is brilliant, of course, because he thinks exactly after the mind of a brilliant physicist theologian, John Polkinghorne, who wrote, the general character of physical reality, and he's talking about the universe here, seems to correspond to a web-like character of interconnected integrity. Reality is relational. God wove interdependence into the nature of everything, from the miracle that is one of yourselves to the miracle that is the universe and everything in between. As a pointer to the greatest of, rea of realities, the fact that everything is made for and meant for and meant to find its fullest expression in relationship to him, from Adam to Archangel. And today, God is calling you to find your place in that, his universe, his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with a, a body and Jesus already there, inviting you to the depending part of interdependence, to lean into that and find life. Not to control you, not to wreck your life, not to give you a useless little role in some back corner, backwater corner of what God is doing in his kingdom's work in this world, but for you to have a place so that you could know him, a meaningful place that others need you to take up. And that is my prayer, going into these future science sermons and for us as a church, that we find that. Because I think if we step into that, there's going to be so much power, and so much freedom, and so much joy to be working in and through and taking up our part in him. So I'm going to close with a prayer, which is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians church which is Paul's prayer for the church, for us. So join me in this. I keep asking 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart and the bendings of your knees and the neural firings of your brain and the self-repairing natures of your DNA and every breath that enters into your lungs may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him with a body at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen.